Hey, everybody. I'm sitting down today with Mr. James Davidson. Um, he's well known in these circles as one of the co-authors of the book, The Sovereign Individual. And he's also the editor of Strategic Investment Newsletter, uh, also the author of several other books. And as we were just discussing offline, you've got quite the storied career. So James, it's an honor of mine to be speaking with you today and welcome to uh, Real Vision. Well, thank you, it's my pleasure. So I wanna jump in here to some of the big excerpts uh, that jumped out at me from your book, The Sovereign Individual. And this is something I have, a book I've been, I've read twice now, I've written quite a bit about it, and I've probably plugged your book in every media appearance I've done in the past five years. I think it's that important. Well, um, one of the major themes and one of the infamous excerpts of the book is that you wrote that microprocessing will subvert and destroy the nation state. And I should remind the audience that this book was written in 1997. Um, so maybe you could just start unpacking that a little bit for us. You know, how did you come to see microprocessing or digital technology, I guess, more generally as this force that would unwind and ultimately destroy the dominant institution in the world today, which is the nation state? Well, I have had a kind of gamey interest for a long time in the underlying forces that alter the costs and rewards of the use of violence and force in the world, which I think is a very important factor always in the outcomes that we see. I was particularly smitten by the impact that gunpowder weapons had on the size of governments and how they function. It, they were a huge tidal force that raised the scale of government. And government has grown, governance has become a matter of gigantic scale. And there are artificial economies to scale in government today, which have to do with the ability to mobilize huge divisions, which maybe through the first half of the last century actually were based on a what I call mega political reality, that having a bigger army and more tanks made you more successful. But then this all changed. The microprocessor is one of the things that changed it. And it, I can foresee that it would really be possible for a single individual, which is going to the smallest possible scale, to have his own army of bots, you know, using AI and whatever, to create havoc, if not create a, a, an arrangement of power. And there's always a lag in these things, and there's always a, a negotiation, which is either explicit or it's implicit, like uh, the Putin negotiation over the, the land corridor into eastern Ukraine. He puts 100,000 troops or more on the border, and everybody's asking, what's, what's he want? And so something will play out that will create a balance between Ukraine and Russia, which is not an encouraging thing from my perspective, because I think that Putin is a sore loser. He's shown that. I mean, he was like Hitler, who was a sore loser about World War I, and his biggest animating desire was to overturn the Versailles Treaty, which had happened 20 years before, maybe. And uh, Putin's big gripe is with the fall of the Soviet Union. He thinks this is a great tragedy, and he wants to reaccumulate it under the influence of Russia, in a way. And I think that when you get a mad dictator who's crazy about fighting recent history, you're really on treacherous territory. You're not really sure what he's going to do. And there's a danger that there would be a war, a big war coming out of this, because I don't trust uh, President Biden and his advisors to get the better of it. And I have thought about the 
analogy with President Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I think is a good one because it entailed finding a win-win solution out of a uh, treacherous moment. And Kennedy did it by proposing to remove the intermediate range missiles that the U.S. had stationed in Turkey in exchange for Khrushchev pulling back the missiles in, in uh, Cuba. It worked out. The world was not destroyed. We didn't have New York City bombed. But after the Soviet Union fell, it became it was confirmed that Khrushchev was planning an, an attack on New York City with hydrogen bombs, which would have been a devastating moment in our lives and those to come after us. So I, I think maybe we need somebody with the brains that Kennedy had at the Hill, the helm today, and I'm not sure we do with Biden. He seems a little sleepy, as Donald Trump said. You, you know, something else you wrote in the book here, I think core to your point here is that we almost need to get away from the arbitrariness of political whim or opinion, right? That seems to be this great danger that you have someone like Putin with so much power and he's in a, he's in a position that um, really his decisions affect the world disproportionately. So the more we can get to a world that's governed by, I guess, and Bitcoin, it's popular to say rules instead of rulers, the more stable um, the world will be. And one of the things you wrote in the book was that, quote, efficiency will become more important than the dictates of power in the organization of social institutions, unquote. So my question would be, what does this mean for the dominant, what I call analog age institutions, which are everything pre-internet? You know, the dominant institutions that remain today are nation states, central banks, increasingly um, non-governmental organizations like the World Economic Forum. What does this mean for them? What is it, this shift towards efficiency uh, and away from the dictates of power? How does this transform the social institutions that we are familiar with? Well, it renders them anachronisms. And anachronisms don't all disappear at once. You know, you can look at the, uh, the fall of Rome as an example. Rome had been, talking about the Western Empire, had been very, very... Uh, powerful and everything depended on the emperor and the, the senators and others had great influence. You can look at the, uh, almost any, pick up any theme from the late days of the Roman Empire and you see the institutions of the empire being not necessarily subverted, but displaced because people themselves could see that things were falling apart and this created a kind of tidal force toward feudalism because individuals in small towns or big towns in Italy and other places in the Roman West, in Gaul particularly, started affiliating with large magnates in their local area. So they would have some protection when things all went to hell. Mm. And they did go to hell. And this became the basis of feudalism because the local guy became the duke or maybe a, just a baron or maybe even an earl if he was lucky. And the, the people who affiliated to these um, local warlords early on were more successful than the ones who were left out in the cold. Mm -hmm. I think that what we're seeing here what we've already begun to see, if I could point out, is that smaller entities are more efficient. Uh -huh. And you can see that if you look at the, the countries in the world that have the highest aggregate life expectancy, they're not big countries, though Korea and Japan are in the mix, but the ones that are the highest are Monaco uh -huh. <laughs> and Marino. Uh -huh. You know, Andorra, little tiny mini states, and they have the highest incomes, the highest life expectancies. And I think that this shows you 
something that we can easily extrapolate from our own experience as Americans. When we see the blue and the red states, they're all sort of in a tangle over different issues. There's the abortion question, which is an important question to be sure, but it's something that splits people apart. Some, especially the rural people, are much more against it than the urban people. And uh, I think that we're losing a lot of the efficiencies that were created by the Constitution when we had a federal government replacing the Articles of Confederation, which was just a sort of wish list. You know, that we were operating on wishes and printed money, which didn't work. Uh -huh. And we tried to create a country with strong money, which is what the Constitution was, because it prohibited the states from printing money. Uh -huh. But it didn't prohibit the central government from printing money. Uh -huh. It's where we've gone crazy. But this is also a point of interesting contrast, because one of the things that technology has done is create the blockchain and Bitcoin and the other coins or blockchain currencies are becoming big. They're displacing government control. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're going to see is an attempt by government to co-opt the, the blockchain by having a Fed coin or something. Right. But that's going to ultimately create, and it already is creating, competitive currencies, which is what F.A. Hayek projected yeah. as a way of stopping the craziness. And I was a big fan of Hayek, and he actually liked me. So I, I <laughs> that's great. Cool. That's a that's a great segue, actually, to my next question here. So, you wrote in the book that quote, just as monarchs, lords, popes, and potentates fought ruthlessly to preserve their custom privileges in the early stages of the modern period, so today's governments will employ violence, often a covert and arbitrary kind, in the attempt to hold back the clock. Unquote. So we're moving, it seems like, as a result of the microprocessor and some second order changes resulting from that, we're moving from this world of highly centralized, organized violence to something that looks much more like um, the monarchical period, right? That was a bit more decentralized, disorganized even. This is a big change for people, right? I mean, we're accustomed to as you describe in the book, the, the nanny nation state, we've all kind of grown up under this protective agus. How should people be thinking about the years ahead? Like how should they be adapting themselves, um, changing their lifestyles, making preparations? How, like what, what are the action items you lay out for people? Well, I think that the first thing that you need to think about is how to maintain independence, which is not easily done. Mm -hmm. I have had a hand in starting three companies that became worth a billion dollars or more. And maybe four if you count Canadian money as a billion. Mm. That's a pretty good record for just sitting around and betting your own worth. But still, it's not enough. You need to have well, I, I think of my friend Peter Thiel, who is uh, a big fan of the sovereign individual. And right. He's even agreed to finance a conference at Oxford as a retrospective on the book. Hmm. And I think he's uh, an example of somebody who is pretty close to being a sovereign individual. <laughs> he's got his own billions, and he's got plenty of uh, interest in technology. You need to have... Flexibility, I think. You have to be able to pivot because however correct the ultimate outline of the sovereign individual's themes may be, it doesn't give you much in the way of timing. It doesn't tell you mm. exactly when things are going to happen. And some things drag on forever, you know. Mm. You, you have the church was in a hegemonic position in the Middle Ages. It didn't just die and go away. It's still with right. us. And there probably will be some vestiges of government 
and popular government in a in a way. Uh, but it's going to be a disappointing prize to control the government in the future mm -hmm. because it's not going to have the capacity to move assets and resources and dictate to people the way it does now. But equally, um, we've read 1984 and other thought exercises about how authoritarianism settles into people. And if you look at something the long ago writings of Spengler on the decline of the West, hmm. he made the very shrewd observation that government by democracy was actually a government by oligarchy. That hmm. the, the governments, the democratic governments would always be controlled by the very rich, which hmm. is contrary to the arithmetic that we often suspect is at work. Right. You think, well, the have-nots will vote things out of the pockets of the haves, but it doesn't usually happen that way, or at least to the conclusive degree that that arithmetic implies. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the things we said in The Sovereign Individual is that government would become, popular government would be reduced to a com competition between demagogues who are mm -hmm. megalomaniacs for control of the most powerful institutions in the world. And I th thought in a way, Donald Trump, who's been very nice to me in his lifetime, was a kind of demagogue in that sense. Mm -hmm. He's been blamed for a lot of things, and some of them he deserved blame for. And I think that you see also the potential rising around the wake in the wake of Trump's presidency for him to be accused of all sorts of crimes, which he probably will be. And he may be indicted. He may need to spend a lot of his money in legal defense against various things that are going to be charged against him because he alienated so many people. So you, he is a sort of cautionary example huh. to the next person who's elected president. Don't do this, that, or the other. You can't really defy the deep state without making sure that it's dis disabled by your defiance. Right. Other than just pissed off. Yeah, great point there. Um, I want to ask this, read this next, next excerpt, then I'll ask a question. You wrote that, quote, market forces, not political majorities, will compel societies to reconfigure themselves in ways that public opinion will neither comprehend nor welcome. As they do, the naive view that history is what people wish it to be will prove wildly misleading, unquote. So today there's this big emphasis on both our individual and collective identities with politics, right? We think that my political opinions, it's my job to go out and like impose my political opinions on others is what the national discourse has uh, increasingly tended towards. But, you know, as you lay out beautifully in your book, when property becomes expensive to violate, politics become largely pointless because the veiled threat of force backing all political action is just less credible. You know, if you can't violate my property, then how can you really tell me what to do? There's not a point of leverage, not as much of a point of leverage. So what do you think the impact of, you know, encryption technology, I'm really focused on Bitcoin here as being like the most expensive form of property to violate ever. How does that change our individual and collective identities uh, in, in a political sense, or maybe even change our worldviews? that people think today we can pass some political, you know, there's some uh, law we can pass, pass at the political level that will change the world. But this transition to the digital age seems to flip all that on its head and put us back into the world of just market forces. Well, I think it does. And I think that the uh, interesting point about Bitcoin is that it brings us so much closer to a period when the wishing well is capped or it's empty. You know, that you see with Bitcoin a very uh, 
elusive target. Governments starting with the Chinese are cracking down on it. You're going to be hearing a lot more, oh, it's only for criminals, it's very dangerous, terrorists are going to use it too much. So we're looking for reasons to bottle it up. But I think the genie is out of the bottle in some respects in this whole process. I don't think that it will be possible to suppress the potential of Bitcoin. It's too huge. It's big right now. And mm-hmm. The price of Bitcoin may fall when governments announce that it's under some penalty or, or other. But I don't believe that it's even possible for the best uh, decryption process to unravel Bitcoin and figure out exactly who's doing what and what blockchain. The blockchain really means it's possible to have a something less than a, a, a money supply. You can have 100% reserve money if but Bitcoin were connected to gold or silver or something, or even just as itself, you can tell whether there's money in the vault, whether the asset is in the vault or isn't. And that is different to what to the technology of the past, where starting with jewelers or whoever was the monetary pioneer of a system. When you got to the gold standard, it was only a gold standard to a point because everybody was not going to demand conversion of his mm-hmm. receipts to gold at once. Right. And nobody could tell which receipt was good and which wasn't. Mm-hmm. With Bitcoin or blockchain, you can tell which receipt is valid. Mm-hmm. You can tell that the receipts are valid or that there is money in the vault or the gold is in the vault. And I think that is going to limit the ability to just have this ever elastic supply of money, which is also misleading us in another respect, because we think while money is very important in the economy, it's not the only thing that drives economic growth. I mean, just having money, if it, just printing money worked, Zimbabwe would have been one of the right. economic powerhouses in the world. Yeah. No evidence of that. And I see uh, our future as being one where it's the potential for governments to do things either by printing money or taxing it away. Are These potentials are being limited, mm-hmm. encroached upon by technology. And eventually, this will become more evident than it is now. And when it becomes mm-hmm. more evident, this is going to create a change in the heads of people. They're going to see. They're going to see that they can't get what they want from the wishing well of politics, or as mm-hmm. much as they think they can. And I looked at some numbers that were put together by a foundation that spent a lot of time analyzing the expenditures made by the 200 biggest corporations in most politically active corporations on campaign contributions, lobbyists, other things to access political power. And these expenditures had produced on average about $750 for every dollar outlay, Hmm. which is a huge return as compared to the 29% that was calculated recently as an average payout for investment in the physical production of goods and services. Hmm. So that mismatch between investment in real in real the real economy and investment in politics tells you that we're at the last stages of the uh, system that was in place. What Hicks called the period of fixed industrial capitalism. Hmm. And if you look at the Soviet Union when it existed, 
Lenin himself said he wanted a system of industrial capitalism, but a monopoly system. He said he was going to organize the whole Soviet Union around the example of the post office. <laughs> that was what he said. I mean, it was right there in plain view if you wanted to look at it. Mm. And that's what they did. It was like having a giant post office controlling everything. You know, you had the Central Committee, the Politburo, and the dictator of the moment who was on shaky ground sometimes. Mm -hmm. The uh, Khrushchev got turfed out because the other members of the Politburo were worried that he was too crazy, that he was going to create a war. And his experience with Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we talked about a little while ago, actually resulted in his being expelled as the, the head communist. Because mm -hmm. the other didn't want to have their dockets incinerated. <laughs> they were mm -hmm. working. Right, right. They, they knew him and they thought he was crazy. Interesting. So, you know, you wrote, you have these other books as well, Blood in the Streets, The Great Reckoning, um, and others, but you, you wrote about mega political variables that you, what you call, and um, to describe these, you said often subtle changes in climate, topography, microbiology, and technology alter the logic of violence. They transform the way people organize their livelihoods and defend themselves. So I thought this was a, just a very novel way to look at the world that there are these boundaries across which power is exercised that exist outside the political domain. These are not f factors or variables under political control much, right? So today, you know, again, we have this world where violence proliferates because it's profitable, right? Because violence is profitable, it's hard to control. And as we've said earlier, encryption represents this defensive technology that makes it very cost-effective to defend your information. And now with things like Bitcoin, your assets or capital. Does this disincentivization, disincentivization of violence and coercion, does this lead us towards a more peaceful, prosperous, wealthy world? Or do well, you see it going well, another way? Well, I think it does, but I don't feel so sanguine about it that I would say, okay, you can throw away your your guns, you can forget about <laughs> right. being attacked on the street, because it won't happen all at once. And it, when it does happen, it may be a long time, a long yeah. maybe centuries. You know, you hear hear all the time a lot of guff about global warming as a phenomenon that I, I find absolutely hilarious if it were not so serious. It's a, it's basically just a, cap, a crony capitalist scheme to mobilize trillions of dollars out of the pockets of people who can't afford it mm -hmm. to save the planet. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I live in South Florida, and here it's particularly interesting because the people who do the radio interviews of various hustlers who have something on their minds don't have any idea at all about the dynamics of sea level rise, for example. Hmm. You, you hear about sea level rise as if there were a sea level. Hmm. You know, the assumption is there is a sea level, which is something, an, a, an intuition that you might have formed in the bathtub, but not in the actual world, you know, because we have these hypothetical uh, measurements mean sea level, which vary by hundreds of feet, usually, from local measurements of where the sea is. And before satellites came along, and we had the uh, 1984 calculation of the geodome as necessary for global positioning. So it's accurate enough to help you get driving instructions. But if you went on a ferry and a year later went on the ferry and read your sea level measurements, you're, you're not going to find your 3.2 
millimeters higher than you were before. Just it's it's insignificant figures. It's totally ridiculous. Yeah. You know, most people don't know that the ocean has hills and valleys in it. You know, if you go into the Indian Ocean, which is, has a lot of the, the sea level, the sea floor there is based on non-magnetic rocks. Whereas if you go into the in, Indonesian archipelago, there are a lot of ultra basic and basic rocks which have been oozing up from the magma in the volcanic activity. And they have ultra basic rocks have much more iron, magnesium, and they're much more gravitationally composing than the silica in the Indian Ocean. So it's actually about 700 feet. The Indian Ocean is 700 feet lower than the ocean in uh, near Indonesia. Wow, interesting. They have, you know, they. they if you could measure it all, you'd see that there are mountains and valleys in the ocean. Wow. It's just a like level, like your bathtub when you sit in it, move it up an inch or two, and then you think, well, God, am I, do I need to, to go on a <laughs> you know? But um, what Archimedes saw in the bathtub and what you see when you get the bathtub is completely misleading in terms of ocean rise and the levels of the ocean. The Permafrost, Al Gore said in 2006 that Wall Street was going to be underwater by now, or at the latest by 2025, which would require melting of the Greenland ice cap. The Greenland ice cap, the average temperature there is minus 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And nobody has, but nobody, even the, the UN climate Nazis has said that you will get that kind of increase in temperature from CO2 marginalizing in the atmosphere. It's not, never going to happen. And Al Gore spent $9 million buying an estate on the ocean in Mendocino, California. Would he have done that if he thought it was going to be underwater <laughs> two years? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make a bit of sense. I mean, it's all a lie. But I think that this is sort of indicative of the final stages of a system that's nearing exhaustion. Yeah, there's this, I've, I've referred to this dynamic as the moralistic camouflage that statism puts on, right? They put on this moral camouflage of, uh, oh, we're passing all of these carbon tax credits because it's for your safety or for the environment to save the world, um, often embellishing this impending climate crisis to, as an excuse to do whatever they want. And then more recently, you know, we've had the, the COVID scare globally and the very, in my opinion, disproportionate state response across multiple dimensions. And again, your book, you brilliantly wrote about this in The Sovereign Individual. I'll read the excerpt. You wrote, quote, those with the earnings ability and capital to meet the competitive challenges of the information age will be able to locate anywhere and do business anywhere. With a choice of domiciles, only the most patriotic or stupid will continue to reside in high tax countries. For this reason, it is to be expected that one or more nation states will undertake covert action to subvert the appeal of transients. Travel could be effectively discouraged by biological warfare, such as the outbreak of a deadly epidemic. This could not only discourage the desire to travel, it could also give jurisdictions throughout the globe an excuse to seal their borders and limit immigration. Unquote. I was pretty damn smart. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what is going on? I mean, is this whole mass hysteria or psych, psych, mass psychosis or um, disproportionate state response to the COVID pandemic, is that a symptom of the predictions you put out in the sovereign individual that, that states are basically fighting for their own viability or survival in the digital age? I would suggest it is. I mean, it seems to me that 
if you look at the history of pathogens and how they interact with people, in the year 1800, there's pretty good evidence that a quarter of the people who ever lived had died of tuberculosis. Hmm. And tuberculosis killed James Monroe, U.S. president. I mean, he was shaking hands with people in the White House. Nobody knew that it was transmitted by a bacterium. And it's still a much more dangerous pathogen than COVID. And I, my personal feeling is that it's a good thing that we got the uh, Omicron version because the natural selection logic of pathogens is that they become more transmittable but less lethal. Mm -hmm. If you had a, a pathogen that was totally legal, lethal, 100% lethal, it would be self-extinguishing. Right. Everybody who got it would die and there'd be no one to, to pass it on to. Mm -hmm. And we see that we've had a huge increase in the transmissibility of the Omicron version. And it's become a uh, wonderful excuse for crony capitalism. The three main companies that produce the two leading vaccinations have been making $65,000 or $65 million a minute from the requirement that you use their product. And they got $8 billion of subsidy to produce the product. Now, you, if you or I started a coffee shop and the government gave us $8 billion to re research different strands of uh, coffee, and then they made everybody drink three cups a day, we'd make a lot of money too. I mean, it's, it's crony capitalism with a capital C. Mm. And um, not to discount the fact that there are many people who have died, and that's unfortunate. But almost all of them, or many of them, had comorbidity comor issues. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to amplify the basic immunity, the immune systems of the people who are confronting this crisis, the government said, okay, we're going to develop a vaccine. We're going to make you take it, and we're going to make you Stay home if you don't take it. Mm -hmm. And we've had in Australia, particularly, a really frightening vitiation of the whole liberal tradition of mm -hmm. allowing individual freedom. People have been arrested for nothing more than criticizing the vaccination program. And they're put into what is called a a center for testing of your disease, but that's actually a concentration camp right. in uh, the Northern Territories where people who've tried to escape have been brought back and they're kept there for no reason, even right. if they test negative. It's not like they're keeping only the positive people there. The people who criticize the system are being incarcerated as well. Yeah, so it's as if, you know, we vest additional powers in government when there's an emergency. So there seems to be this very real incentive for governments to create emergencies just to consolidate power. Um, and I would argue that we're also seeing a lot of that manifest in the censorship or attempted censorship of free speech, uh, in particular online, you know, cancel culture has become rampant. Um, the idea of actually just censoring dialogue. You know, a lot of people have been attacking Joe Rogan for just having open conversations with people about these topics and others. And I loved in, in the book, The Sovereign Individual, one of the things you wrote was that, quote, as in, refer, in reference to the medieval church, you said the church found that censorship did not suppress the spread of subversive technology. It merely assured that it was put to its most subversive use. And this was largely in regard to the printing press, I believe, or the printing press as a, which made the dissemination of information much cheaper, started to break the church's stranglehold or monopoly on knowledge. 
Um, you know, so clearly free speech in the digital age is important for human freedom. It's very important to the liberal tradition. What are the parallels between the church's attempts to censor the printing press and modern censorship and or cancel culture? And how do you see it playing out? Do you think censorship is something that will be self-defeating, kind of like the church's attempts to censor the printing press? Um, or do you see it going another direction? Well, I hope that it's self-defeating. Uh, here I may be uh, less deterministic than I was in writing The Sovereign Individual because I realized that it's possible to have local effectiveness of censorship and local uh, authoritarianism succeeding because it's happened and continues to happen. But if you look, we, you mentioned the example of Joe Rogan and the cancel culture. Cancel culture, culture it, what it is, is a, in some ways a kind of confession by the powers that be that the whole thing is really stupid. Look at, look, think of stupidity. I take the example of the cancel culture tirade on um, grounds that are feeble-minded. You, know, <laughs> you look at uh, the actress uh, Johansson, who was mm. excoriated for playing an agent's an Asian cyborg who had the memories of an Asian woman, not even a human being in that sense. Does that make any sense? I mean, why does it matter? And you look at so many of these things, they're <clears throat> tempest in a teapot where people are frightened by the fear of being left out or losing their movie contract or whatever it's going to be. Mm. And it's all based on a strange uh, relationship between the state and the major technology companies that are the hosts of the expression, the transmission of expression. It's like mm -hmm. the, if the medieval church had been smart enough to buy Gutenberg's press, Mm -hmm. or the other, buy up all the other printing presses, but they couldn't because they kept proliferating. Mm -hmm. They could have said, no, no, we're not going to publish Galileo. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's an evil demon. But I think we're, we have to see past that, and I think there's going to be a lot of competition. You're going to see probably, and I did write about this in The Sovereign Individual, that people would be assorting their news channels to their taste. So they mm -hmm. have, we talked about fake news, but there's news, there's fake news that we want to read and there's fake news that we ridicule. It really does, to my mind, show the value of the classical liberal education where you're supposed to learn to think. Mm -hmm. And I had the advantage of having a good education. I, uh, I particularly liked the system at Oxford where I was, where I studied, but huh. where you read the original. I mean, I didn't read somebody's comments on Marx. I read Marx, uh -huh. I read Adam Smith, the original, not somebody else's interpretation of it. And if you learn to do that and you think, you know a much, you know much more about the world, you're better prepared for the crap that gets thrown at you. Some of it's mm -hmm. space, but some of it doesn't. But you don't want to end up with typhoid because people are throwing crap at you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be smart enough to navigate it, to pivot around it. Excellent points. Um, I guess one last question. So how did you, I mean, you predicted in the book, I think you guys called it anonymous digital cyber cash. Like once it became a technological reality, that people would start to dump inflationary national currencies to hold, um, you know, non-inflationary or less inflationary 
private monies effectively. Given how successful Bitcoin has been to date, um, I think its most recent peak was over one trillion dollar market cap. Is is this happening faster than you expected? About as fast as you expected? Did you did you think it would be this um, impactful in such a short amount of time? I and mean, we're only thirteen years in, uh, but it's kind of already become a global phenomenon. So I'd like to just hear how you thought this would play out versus how it actually is playing out. Well, I think that, or I thought, to go back to what I was initially imagining, I thought it would play out. And I was curious to see how fast it would play out because it depends on the legacy space in people's heads. You know, that mm. one of the things you learn from watching ads on television is that in the Super Bowl particularly, which is coming along in a few weeks, I hope I'm not prejudicing the programmer by revealing when we recorded it, but the space in people's heads is a valuable thing. The landscape in your head, where mm -hmm. your, your ideas are. And those ideas could be petrified or they could be dynamic. It's hard to tell mm -hmm. with a group of people how things work out. And it depends, I think, on how successful the nation state is. I feel that this latest COVID crisis, the plague that we've been going through has accelerated the discredit of the nation state. Mm -hmm. People feel annoyed by it everywhere because we have other things that kill you that don't require you to stay in your home and to lock down the whole world. And some of the other things are more deadly by far than COVID-19, even in its most aggressive form to date. You know, the death rate from contracting tuberculosis is still 10 times higher than COVID. Well, thank God most people don't get tuber tuberculosis because it's sort of receded into the margins of the world. But it's, a, it's still a danger. And we didn't. We never, in the 19th century, we never said, okay, tuberculosis is rampant. Let's uh, close the economy until we find a solution. <laughs> there never would have been an economy if we'd done mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, uh, an indictment of the whole process, that the, the powers that be are obviously not concerned about how to make your life better, they've got their own agenda, which is, oh boy, a crisis. We can't let it go to waste. We've got to use it to aggrandize our own power. And there's an inevitable ratchet effect. They make it more and more their own purpose. When they create, create a grab for power, they don't ever say, okay, the, the crisis is over. You can go back to everything you could do before the crisis. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work that way. It's a one-way right. street. But that doesn't mean it's an inevitable accumulation that gets to a point where there's no option for freedom. And I, I think that the freedom that we prize as individuals is going to be amplified as we go forward. There was a really interesting uh, economic historian at the time of the First World War named Irene, who had a concept called Irene's Pendulum. He was kept in a German prisoner of war camp, he was a Frenchman, and he, uh, he had such a, an encyclopedic knowledge of his sources that he could write a book and fill in the footnotes, the pages hmm. and everything, when he did it in prison. And he pointed out that there's been this pendulum that goes back and forth between periods of regulation and periods of freedom. Mm. Now that's something that's in the heads of people without it there even being aware of it, like the many mm. tens of thousands of impulses that your body sends to your brain in terms of re recording and reporting mm. things that happen. You know, that you, you don't know what's going on in your kneecap. You don't want to know. 
<clears throat> you don't want to think about that. It's not a self-conscious bit of information, but there is information there. And I think that we're in a time when the accumulation of these impulses is going to make for more freedom. The people mm -hmm. be more free. We're due to have Perrine's pendulum swing back in the direction of freedom. And technology just so happens to be playing a, a leading role in making that possible. We do have the, the blockchain technology, and I think eventually we're going to have more and more of it. And I think that ultimately, through one mechanism or another, we're going to have a freedom that we haven't had and probably a breakup of major big countries like the United States and China. They're going to break up and uh, we'll be more successful and more, we'll be happier running little city states mm -hmm. with the hinterlands around them. I mean, San Francisco could be a, an amazing city state. It probably will be. Miami would be an interesting city state. My friends in South America have always said about Miami, such a great city and so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> they love it because you can speak Spanish there or Portuguese if you want to. And um, I think that if you look at what goes on in Monaco, where the average aggregate life expectancy is almost 90 years of age, counting men and women, there's no reason to think that you give up, give up a lot of life quality by having smaller entities. Mm. That these smaller entities have the advantage of not being matched, it's sort of like the, the octagon where people get in and mm. beat the shit out of one another is using no holds barred kind of philosophies because that's what people want to watch, but it's not, to me, evident that we won't see a de facto city-state situation. You only have to go back to the doctrine of nullification. We see that in, in some sense at work in the, uh, the cities that have not decided, have act, opted not to enforce immigration laws. You know, there are plenty of cities where you can go and if you're not documented, you can be pretty safe and pretty sure that you're not going to be turfed out. Hmm. And that's a sort of subtracting one of the main points of the Civil War. You know, you have the, uh, the potential that this will grow and that the number of factors that could lead to that will grow. We also have the anomalies that arise out of the treatment of so-called First Nations, if we use the Canadian term, or the American Indian uh, tribes that have the ability to organize gambling on their properties, which would be illegal if you were just an ordinary person <clears throat> without the membership in the Indian band. So maybe there's going to be a, an equivalent kind of breakout. And at some point, the governments may decide that it's better to let Peter Thiel hire a, an ocean liner and put it off the coast of California and do whatever he wants to do there without following all the laws and dotting all the T's and dotting all the I's and crossing the T's that would be required if they were done ordinarily. And we have that same kind of thing, I think, with the FDA, which has been a very uh, aggressive institution promoting the pharmaceutical model of medicine which is a very interesting one. It came into being in the early 19th century, really. If you look at the history of our country and think of George Washington, our first president, who was 
interestingly, the richest man in the United States when he was president. He died of having been bled to death, basically, mm -hmm. when he got a cold. In two days, he was killed because he got the best medical care available. And it was deadly. And he died right away. He got a cold, and two days later, he was dead because they bled, drained his blood from his body. That was the sort of the death knell of the humor model of medicine, where you had the fire earth, right. you know, and if you were had a temperature, they thought you had too much blood, so they took yeah. it off. And a good warning against the dangers of intervention, right? And we're always we always have a tendency to try to intervene, but often we create unintended consequences. Usually, and most of them are bad, mm -hmm. bad consequences. I have a mate who was at Oxford with me, or I was with him. His name is Matt Freeman. He is the head of the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology at the University of Oxford. And he has been saying for years that we're at the end of the pharmaceutical age, that we're going to have a period of regenerative medicine where various tech, uh, biotechnologies like stem cell manipulation and use of various things to enhance the length of telomeres will result in people living longer and healthy, healthier lives without being slaves to pharmaceutical companies. I think that's going to happen and it's probably going to be a, a good thing. And we're going to see that it makes sense to live a life with healthy habits rather than uh -huh. becoming a fat slob and <laughs> type 2 diabetes and dying. Yeah. Well, I think that looking forward to more freedom, more health, and presumably more wealth too, right? When we get governments out of our pockets, that increases aggregate wealth for everyone. I think that's really something to look forward to in the digital age. And James, I've got to thank you for writing this book because it's been very influential on my thinking. Um, it's, a, it's a prized asset in the Bitcoin community. People really appreciate what you did in this book and others. Um, and I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you for speaking with me today. And um, if you want to let the audience know where they can find out more about you or your work, please do. Well, they could go to strateginvestment.com and take a trial subscription to our newsletter, which is an investment newsletter. And if I could blow my own horn, I think I've done a damn good job. I, in February of 2020, I told people that the uh, COVID crisis was going to be a huge deal. And anybody who subscribed and followed my advice and took the profits when I suggested would have made almost $60,000 within a few months of that time, which makes a subscription, a trial subscription for $67 or 69 or whatever it is, a damn good bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had, I think I've done, as I mentioned, I mentioned to you before we started talking that in the mid 1980s, when I first started writing strategic investment, I noisily proclaimed that the Soviet Union was on the threshold of collapse. Mm. When Boris Yeltsin came, first came to the United States, I was one of the people he asked to meet, which is an unusual feedback for an investment letter for 67 or $69 a year. And I, I was very honored to have that chance to meet Yeltsin, surprised to see that he had lost his fingers on one hand. And he was quite a rosy guy because he was quite alcoholic, I believe, but I had a very interesting and intelligent conversation with him. The Soviet Union ceased to exist on 25th of December, 1991. And I was suddenly not the moron that I had been accused of being when I said it was going to happen. That's a funny thing when you when you go short on something, I guess, either in your portfolio or in your opinion, 
you can be proved wrong for a long time before you're vindicated. So <laughs> glad that one worked out for you. Well, it didn't really work out the way I wanted it to because I, I thought the Soviet Union was going to collapse. And what I did about it is bought a house on the Nevesky Prospect in St. Petersburg, as it now is, again. Mm -hmm. But Putin forced me out. Mm -hmm. When he was working as an aide to the mayor, I, I was obliged to sell too early. Mm -hmm. But what I should have done is gone to Ladbrokes and bet a million dollars that the Soviet Union would collapse. Mm -hmm. They would have given me odds like, who knows, and it would have been a billion dollar win. <laughs> they wouldn't have been able to pay the bill, probably. <laughs> but, you know, nobody then thought it was going to happen. Yeah. There are other things. I, I said that Japan was going to, the Japanese stock market was going to collapse. And I have a subscriber in Texas who made a million dollars out of that, which is a wow. good turn on a cheap subscription. Yeah. I think the macro advice that we've had has been relatively credible. I mean, you can't always be right. Mm -hmm. And you can't think you're going to always be right. You have mm -hmm. to recognize that it's a game of probabilities. And you make a bet, yeah. then you make another bet, and they have to work out somehow. You have to hope that the first one pays off rather than loses. Right. So and can, following the economics as you do, uh, I think that's key because ultimately humans are going to do what's in their self-interest and economics, largely the economics of force dictates what those activities are. Um, so again, thank you. You know, thank you for opening my eyes to that side of economics. And in addition to being a great book, your book's got a, a great bibliography with a lot of other resources that intelligently communicate these complex topics. So thank you. You know that Peter Thiel did the introduction to the, the uh, audio version. <laughs> so if people are interested in knowing more, they could get the audio version with the Peter Thiel forward. And we've got a, you can have a lot of drive time <laughs> education. <laughs> yes, indeed. James, thank you so much. This has been a privilege and an honor to speak with you. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. The world keeps changing, so there's always something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Well, thank you. Hey there, revolutionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto and get unlimited access to the most brilliant minds in finance and crypto. Join our community of lifelong learners for exclusive access, unparalleled education, and unbiased insights.